really special event for the Omni presentation. We've never done a cohesive symposium this way before, and I think the topic is so apropos, so important for today. I'm Professor Lynn Miller, Professor of Anthropology here at Maricosta College, and we're going to have four terrific speakers today talking on different facets of obesity. But I want to start with a couple of introductory remarks and some statistics. <coughs> I think it is fair enough to say that obesity has reached epidemic proportions in America. Yes, current estimates are that 40% of American adults are obese. Not just overweight, but clinically obese. And that's terrifying. Equally terrifying is the fact that 20% of children in America are clinically obese. Not just overweight, but obese. And that has set them on a life life lifetime trajectory, which is really disconcerting. Equally terrifying is how much these numbers have risen in just the last 10 years. Think about your life over the last 10 years. How many uh, ads on TV do you hear about the latest diet or a program you can, a weight loss program you can participate in? Americans are spending $70 billion a year on the diet industry. And yet, over the last 10 years, when we've all been trying to lose weight, we have actually increased in weight by 25%. So in just the last 10 years, we've gone from 30% obesity to 40% obesity. This is terrifying. Where does it stop? It is not just an American phenomenon. Worldwide rates of obesity are increasing at roughly similar rates. Obviously, we associate this with the more developed nations. But one of the things that concerns me is that in many developing nations, we are seeing the amazing juxtaposition because of poor access to high quality foods, of people being simultaneously overweight and also suffering from malnutrition. What an amazing state to be in. Okay, how do we measure overweight? You guys all familiar with something called the body mass index? Is that something? Okay, you're roughly nodding. You've all heard of the body mass index. This is basically a ratio of your height to your weight. Uh, you can easily go online and find a body mass index calculator. And uh, just for some rough statistics, if you tap in on your phone and look for one of these body mass calculators, if you score a 25 or higher, you're considered overweight. If you score a 30 or higher, you are considered clinically obese. So this is one of our standard measurement practices around the world. Why should we care? So you're a little heavier. So we have to uh, rebuild the small world ride at Disneyland because the riders are so much heavier than they used to be 30 years ago. Did you know they actually had to do that? They had to dredge it out because the boats were riding so low in the water. You guys all know the consequences. There are enormous health consequences associated with being clinically obese. Think about the diseases you guys all know about. Heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, all that pressure on your joints. Certain forms of cancer, not all of them, but the reproductive cancers that women worry about, the prostate cancer that men worry about, these are all significantly, the risk factors are significantly higher when you're looking at people with obesity. And of course, whether or not you in particular happen to be suffering from this problem, the entire nation bears the cost. The estimates for the cost of obesity in the United States vary widely, but just the medical costs alone of caring for the people with the arthritis and the diabetes and heart attack are anything between 150 and 200 billion dollars a year. B, billion with a B. Billion dollars a year, and that's the direct medical costs. Never mind the so-called indirect costs of people missing work because they are sick or have to go to doctor's appointments billions and billions more dollars. So this is a problem that Americans need to pay attention to. The problem is, although we hear about Weight Watchers and we hear about Nutrisystem, we don't hear enough about the various risk factors, the underlying risk factors. It's not all just about whether or not you just ate a cranberry muffin. There are a lot of underlying risk factors. There are dozens of factors that contribute to obesity. What you are going to hear today is about three particular factors and then a really disconcerting talk about why diet and exercise don't work. So uh, I have got four absolutely terrific presenters today. And in the context of that, let's go ahead and get this show on the road. Kylie, would you like to come up and get your uh, talk booted up for us? So the plan is, while she's getting things started up, uh, each student is going to make his or her presentation. Directly after the presentation, we're going to take one or two specific questions. And part of the reason I'm going to encourage you guys to grab a pen is I also want you to write your questions down. Because after all four talks, we're going to bring everybody up for a panel discussion at the end. Because, of course, one of the things you're going to see is that all of these factors are interrelating. So when you have a question, please jot it down 
and uh, and again, we do have a pen and paper over here as needed. Any questions so far? All right, thank you so much. So our first speaker for today is Kylie Nicoshea, and she's going to be talking to us about bugs in the gut. Isn't that yes. encouraging? Early gut microbiome colonization and obesity development. Take it away, Kylie. So think about what you had for breakfast this morning. You might be thinking, I didn't have breakfast. Well, think about what you would have wanted to have for breakfast this morning. Now, you might think that you had that food all to yourself, but you actually shared it with a vast community of microbes that live inside of your digestive tract. Now, before I get started, there's a lot to digest. Sorry. So <laughs> I want to start by defining some terms. So first, micro. This refers to a microscopic organism or microorganisms, such as bacteria. Second is microbiota. This refers to a collection of these microbes that live in and on the body. Third is microbiome. This refers to the environment in which these microbes live, and the human body um, has many microbiomes, including our skin microbiome, our mouth microbiome, and the largest and most uh, diverse microbiome in our body is our gut microbiome. Now, for the purposes of this talk, when I'm referring to gut, I'll be referring primarily to the large intestine, or the colon, where most of these microbiota live. <coughs> so the mi gut microbiome refers to the diverse ecosystem of trillions of these <coughs> microbial inhabitants that live inside of our large intestine, including archaea, protozoa, viruses, and most predominantly, bacterial cells. Now, these bacteria have very distinct functions and play an important role in the metabolizing of nutrients and digestion in our body. Uh, they convert otherwise indigestible forms of food into digestible forms. They harvest energy or calories from the food that we consume. Um, and they regulate how various nutrients are absorbed and deposited in the body, which determines whether someone can lose or gain weight. Now, there are two dominant bacterial phylum, uh, or groups, mainly Formicutes bacteria and Bacteroidetes bacteria. And they both have distinct functions that they play. So Bacteroidetes bacteria helps to control healthy weight in the body. It also prevents against increased fat storage. And Formicutes is efficient at harvesting energy or calories from the food that we consume. Now, I want to make it clear that neither of these bacteria are bad on their own and in their proper quantities and ratios, but it's when they become unbalanced that problems can ensue. So the ratio of these bacteria impact how energy is harvested in the body. Scientists have recently discovered that the ratio of our gut microbiota, or the ratio of gut microbiota, differ between healthy and unhealthy gut microbiomes. So in a, in a healthy microbiome, uh, there are high levels of this Bacteroidetes bacteria and low levels of this Formicutes bacteria, and an overall high diversity of microbiota. Whereas in obese or unhealthy microbiomes, there are high levels of Formicutes bacteria relative to low levels of Bacteroidetes bacteria and an overall low diversity of microbiota. Why? Because an increased Formicutes levels uh, cause increased fat absorption. So you have higher Formicutes levels, this increases the host's ability to harvest energy or calories from the food that we're consuming, which increases ultimately fat storage in animals' tissue. So essentially, you're consuming the same amount of food, but you're extracting more calories from it. So Formicutes bacteria helps to increase the absorption of dietary fats and allows the host organism to extract more calories, as I said, from the same amount of food. And this can promote the absorption of dietary fats in the intestine, which can cause subsequent metabolic disturbances and can lead ultimately to obesity development. Now, this was looked at in one cross-sectional study of obese versus lean children, in which children between the ages of 6 to 16 were looked at. Um, 26 were obese and 27 were lean. And researchers collected their fecal samples in order to determine their gut microbial composition. And they determined that obese children had higher Formicutes ratios relative to lower Bacteroidetes ratios. And they concluded that high Formicutes levels are markers of obesity. Now, this is a correlational study. However, scientists at the Washington University School of Medicine wanted to test causation. So does a disturbed gut microbiome cause obesity? So what they did was they took two groups of genetically identical germ-free or bacteria-free mice. And in the first group, they implanted them with, or they transplanted bacteria from 
uh, lean mice. So that was marked by high bacteroidetes levels and high overall microbiota diversity. In the second group, they implanted uh, the bacteria from the gut microbiomes of obese mice, uh, which were marked with high fermentities levels and low overall diversity. And they fed both groups of mice the same diets, the same quantity of food, and they monitored the mice for eight weeks. And what they found was that at the end of this eight weeks, um, the mice who had been implanted with the lean bacteria remained lean, and the mice who had been implanted with the obese bacteria <laughs> became obese. And so the scientists concluded that Formicides bacteria does increase fat storage in adipose tissue, and Formicides gut bacteria increases the possibility to extract more calories uh, by stimulating fat absorption. So what disturbs the gut in the first place? Well, our gut microbiomes are, can be shaped and influenced throughout our lifespan, but our gut microbiomes are almost fully formed by the time we're three. So that means that how your gut microbiome looked when you were about three years old is nearly similar, is very similar to how it looks like today. That means that from the window from day one that we're born until age three is perhaps the most critical and significant window of gut microbial development and colonization. And it is significantly shaped by early life events, such as birth delivery, method of feeding, and antibiotic exposure. And it all starts on the day that you're born. So there are two methods of birth delivery, namely vaginal birth delivery and cesarean birth delivery. Now, um, let's see this. a mother's birth canal is colonized with beneficial bacteroidetes bacteria. Um, and is high, highly diverse in beneficial gut microbiota. Therefore, as a child travels through the, the mother's birth canal, it takes in through its eyes, there you go, it takes in through its eyes, nose, and mouth this beneficial bacteria, uh, which then is able to colonize its gut microbiome. <coughs> but what happens if the child misses out on the so-called microbial bath? Well, the other option for birth delivery is C-section or cesarean section, um, and I want to be clear that this can be a life-saving procedure uh, for both the mother and the child. However, over one-third of babies in the U.S. are born via C-section, and many are electively, many of these procedures are electively chosen um, in order to, as a convenient way to bypass the labor process, which unfortunately is a very process through which the child is colonized by this beneficial bacteria. So instead of being colonized by the mother's uh, beneficial bacteria from her birth canal, the child is instead colonized with the bacteria <coughs> in the surrounding hospital environment, which is significantly less diverse in beneficial bacteria. Um, this, the effects of this were looked at in one study with 34 vaginal born infants and 30 cesarean born infants. Um, and researchers collected their fecal flora in order to determine their microbial diversity. Um, and researchers found that the cesarean born infants had delayed microbial establishment, lagging about one month behind their vaginal born counterparts. And cesarean born infants were less colonized with bacteroidetes, sorry, bacteroidetes bacteria um, and had lower overall diversity. So they concluded that the C-section method or procedure does cause a less diverse gut microbiota with lower levels of bacteroidetes bacteria. Now the second early life colonization event is method of feeding. There are two primary methods of feeding, um, namely breastfeeding and formula feeding, um, and both have consequences to our microbiome. So breast milk is rich in uh, bacteroidetes positive or good bacteria, um, and it's also rich in oligosaccharides, which actually the child cannot digest on its own. They are there simply to feed the microbes in the child's gut. Uh, so this results in microbial diversity, and studies show that breastfeeding protects against weight gain as the child matures. The other option is formula feeding, which also has microbial consequences. So uh, formula, as much as they try to mimic it, um, is absent of oligosaccharides, which means that the microbes are not fed in the child's gut, uh, which results in less diversity in the child's gut microbiome. Uh, studies have shown that children who are formula-fed have higher levels of fermentides bacteria relative to lower bacteroidetes bacteria, and uh, a 26% higher risk of obesity in later childhood. So a study at UC Davis looked at over 1,000 infants 53% were breastfed and 46% were formula fed. And again, they looked at their, um, they collected fecal samples at 12 months of age in order to determine their microbial uh, composition. And they determined that for me, these concentrations were higher in the uh, formula fed infants than their breastfed counterparts. And they discovered that at 12 months of age, 
changed the formula that infants had nearly twice as high a rate, uh, I'm sorry, a risk of being overweight than their breastfed counterparts. Um, and the scientists concluded that formula-fed infants had an increased risk of obesity in later life as well. Now the third early life colonization event is antibiotic exposure. Again, antibiotics can be life-saving, they are life-saving medical advancements when administered properly. However, keep in mind that antibiotics don't just sterilize or kill the bad bacteria, they also kill the good bacteria, which can affect our gut microbiomes. So they can be administered in early life during C-section, I'm sorry, during gestation, during C-section, um, and the average child in the U.S. is administered three courses of antibiotics by the age of two. Um, and children exposed to antibiotics under six months of age may never fully recover <coughs> that lost gut microbiota. And this lost gut microbial diversity increases the risk of being overweight in your life. So a study looked at these effects um, by taking two groups of mice, um, one group they administered antibiotics to, and the second group they did not. It was a control group. Um, and they fed both groups identical high-fat diets uh, beginning when they were 13 weeks old. Um, and they collected fecal samples to determine their gut microbial establishment. And they monitored them for 32 weeks. What did they find? Well, they found that the antibiotic-fed mice uh, developed gut microbial communities that resembled immature or underdeveloped microbial communities, uh, which lacked diversity and beneficial bacteria. They also found that antibiotic fed mice uh, developed increased weight and fat mass compared to their non antibiotic fed um, counterparts. So they concluded in the study that antibiotic exposure causes microbial disruption and excess weight gain. The method by which a baby is born, uh, is fed, and is administered antibiotics is a very personal decision uh, to be made by the child's parents. However, hopefully by shedding light on some of these early life events and how they impact our gut microbiome and later life obesity can help us to make more informed decisions. Thank you. Wonderful start. Uh, so what we're going to do is take about one or two questions specifically for Kylie, and then uh, if you don't have a chance to get to your question right now, please jot it down so that we can do it later on during the panel discussion. So, questions for Kylie? John. So, oh, I'm not John. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay, great. Um, do, is it important for infants to be exposed to the bacteria before birth, or can they just like dip them in a bacterial bath after? Can they dip? Okay. Can they be exposed to bacteria before birth? You mean do, the, do they need to be exposed to the bacteria before birth when like their stress hormones, hormones are really high, or can it be effective to expose them artificially to bacteria after they're born? That's a great question. Um, so I'm going to go off of what I researched, which was um, I, for C-section, and I'm sorry if this doesn't fully answer your question, but I researched for C-section, there are some um, doctors who are after the mothers are having the baby's face C-section, actually are trying, are putting the, it's like a cloth basically, and they're putting it in the uh, birth canal um, and then swabbing the baby after it is born via C-section with that bacteria. Um, I don't think that, in the, in the womb, if that's what you were also asking, um, the babies from the studies that show it now um, are not colonized with bacteria in during gestation. That's entirely what you were asking. <laughs> well, but is it effective when they wipe down the baby, the C-section babies? That's what they're studying. Okay, so but they don't know the <laughs> results yet. Close but you down. don't know. We don't know the results of that. We study don't know yet. the results yet. I think it's been about three years, and in one of the studies, um, and they have shown that they, by I think, I think it was a six-month part point, uh, but they do start to resemble the bacterial communities of their vaginal counterparts. Okay. About but it's new, so. Right. Yeah. 